Of course, the pudding that we all associate with Charles Dickens is the wonderful Christmas pudding. Interestingly, if you read A Christmas Carol, which is what made the Christmas pudding famous, you won't find a mention of Christmas pudding. What you'll find is plum pudding. Now, plum pudding is what everybody called this wonderful, warm, celebratory dish. And the Brits were incredibly proud of it. Some genius discovered that if you got a cloth, greased it very well, and poured what we call plum potage, in and bound it up and boiled it, you got this lovely, rich, round pudding. And that's why when you see a picture of a plum pudding in a Victorian story, it's probably like a cannonball. Dickens took this idea of a celebration dish and he anchored it to the day, to Christmas Day itself. Two years after The Christmas Carol was published, in 1845, Eliza Acton, who was a wonderful recipe writer, gave the first recipe for what, is, what she called Christmas pudding. And what's really a nice little mystery is that she calls it the author's Christmas pudding. Now, does she mean herself as the author? Or does she mean that it's Dickens's Christmas pudding? We'll never know, but it's a great recipe and we should make it. So let's go. One of the fantastic things about it is actually how easy it is. Most of the ingredients are dry and all you do is simply mix them together. So we'll start off with 85 grams of plain flour. Add one little pinch of salt and then add in all these delicious things. Suet. Now you can use vegetarian suet. This happens to be beef suet and quite honestly I think beef suet probably gives a slightly more kind of toffee-ish, slightly richer flavour. That's 170 grams. This is 140 grams of brown sugar and here is about a teaspoon of mixed spice. If you don't have mixed spice, you can just put in some cinnamon, a bit of nutmeg, a bit of allspice, what you have really. 170 grams of breadcrumbs. And then we're gonna put in the plums. Now, these look like raisins and these look like currants, but it got its name as plum pudding because in those days, a plum was just a small, rich, dried fruit. Plum pudding is not actually made from what we call plums today. I've put in 170 grams of raisins, 170 grams of currants, and here about 55 grams of cut mixed peel. And the difficult bit, just make sure they're all nicely mixed up together. And one of the reasons you steam it for such a long time is that you turn that sugar, or the lovely sugar, brown sugar, and all the sugar in the, um, the dried fruit it becomes really kind of caramelised and rich, and that's one of the reasons you get that lovely toffee flavour in Christmas pud. Now, Eliza Acton puts a little bit of apple in her pudding, which I think is nice. It helps to make it light. It doesn't really matter exactly what size it is. This is quite a small one. Again, make sure your apple is really well distributed. It all gets bound together with three eggs. Give your eggs a good old beat and then give them a treat. 140 millilitres of brandy. Combine well. Eggs and brandy go in. And now, of course, this is the bit that you need to do on Stir Up Sunday, because this year, 2018, Stir Up Sunday is the 25th of November, five weeks before Christmas. And it's a rather nice combination, Stir Up Sunday, of sort of folklore and uh, the Church, the Book of Common Prayer, because it's taken from the, the phrase, stir up our wills, we beseech thee, O Lord, asking God to make you more kind of redoubtable. And people took the idea of stir up and added it to their pudding. And also probably not very old, but the idea of making a wish as you stir up your pudding. And the next thing to do is grease your pudding basin a, a litre and a half. Put a tiny little circle of greaseproof paper in the bottom of it, which just helps it turn out. And then 
make sure you get it in and just pack it down because it needs to be quite dense. You don't want any air holes, but it's a heavy old mixture, it's unlikely. And just really enjoy that smell, that lovely smell of brandy and Christmas. So here is going to be the first ever Christmas pudding. And what we need to do is cover it very tightly, very securely with a circle of greaseproof paper. And again, be grateful for greaseproof paper and be grateful that we don't have to make everything with pudding cloths like our probably our great grandmothers now did. You need to have a layer of paper, greaseproof paper in a layer of foil. Put a little tuck in both of them because when the heat of the pudding expands it needs some air, some space to go. And then this is the fun bit, slightly tricky bit. You have to make sure everything is really tightly packed down like that. And then you need two long pieces of string, kitchen string. Put, find the lip of your bowl and put it tightly around. So I'm going to put one little half knot there and then I'm going to do another little knot at this end. There's quite a long tail and you'll see why in a second. If you can get somebody else's finger just in there to tie it, that's always a good thing. Then the second piece of string, do it the other way. Really think about making it tight because that's how you stop the water invading your pudding when you're cooking it. And there we have two nice pieces of string that can become a handle when you put your pudding into the pot. And then we need to give it a boil. Give it a good old steam, get the water in about halfway up the pudding basin, put a lid on, and you probably need to give it between three and four hours, three and a half hours, because that lets all that sugar turn into a lovely, that kind of lovely dark toffee taste. You need to cook it immediately. If you're not going to eat it immediately, store it somewhere cool and dry. And then when you reheat it, just reheat it again in the same way for about an hour or an hour and a half in boiling water. So our pudding has been boiling for about three and a half hours. Now it's time to turn it out. And this is that lovely bit in A Christmas Carol that you'll probably know really well where Mrs Cratchit does one of the most wonderful things she has since her marriage and she produces this gorgeous pudding. Now we know she doesn't have an oven, she's too poor to have an oven because she has to send her goose to the bakers to be cooked. And she did what a lot of poor people did and they just made do. So she boils her pudding in the washing copper and when she unpacks it there's that smell of wash day and pudding all in one go. And there's our lovely pudding with, of course, a sprig of holly on top. It's lovely in A Christmas Carol when Mrs Cratchit comes in proudly bearing her Christmas pudding and she's poured brandy on it and it's ignited. But she's also got some holly on top. Now, obviously, the holly would burn. And it's one of those rare instances when Dickens doesn't get his domestic details quite right. But on the whole, his knowledge of cooking and housekeeping, what went into a Christmas pudding, was pretty good for a Victorian man. And of course, we're indebted to Dickens for really making us feel that Christmas pudding belongs to Christmas Day. And it's something that we can all share and all enjoy on the same day together. If you'd like to find out more about how Charles Dickens influenced our Christmas food and what he and his friends and family would have had for Christmas of Victorian London, come and see Food, Glorious Food, Dinner with Dickens. It's an exhibition about food and dining in Dickens's life. It's on at the Charles Dickens Museum in Doughty Street in London, and it's on until the 22nd of April, 2019.